Good morning and welcome to the uh, Transportation Committee meeting. If the committee members could take their seats, please. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, no declarations of interest. Uh, could we confirm the minutes of uh, the 2nd of May 2018? Thank you. Um, we have a number of inquiries. Um, does anybody want to lift any of the inquiries? Okay, uh, so pavement markings? Okay, so we'll just hold that then. Okay, we have the motion on the table, but you'd, you'd also like the inquiry lifted? The inquiry should be as there so people have further information. Okay, so someone is going to have to make that request on behalf of Councillor Wilkinson because she's not a sitting member. Anybody? Councillor Cactus? Okay, so we'll hold that one as well. Um, the first item on the agenda is parking spaces to accommodate cars and cyclists. And there is a replacement motion uh, that is being circulated now, so everybody will get a copy shortly on that from the clerk's office. Uh, and that will be introduced by the Vice Chair when we get to that matter. Um, item number two is gateway uh, speed limit signage from residential areas. And we have a speaker on that, so we'll hold that item as well. And we also have a presentation, a brief presentation from staff. Uh, Councillor Weeper, who's also uh, here today but not a member of the committee, has asked that uh, item number three be uh, taken off this agenda and added to the next agenda uh, because there are certain people that want to come to speak to that matter that aren't available uh, to be there to be here today, and it is a councillor's item. So, is someone willing to move that? Uh, count Thank you, Councillor Minette. Is that acceptable to everybody? Okay. We'll see you next meeting, Jeff. And bring, and bring the snake. Um, and uh, and uh, item number item number four um, is uh, another uh, councillor's uh, item, uh, Councillor Caudry. So we'll we we'll want to speak to that. We'll hold that one. And. So before we uh, get into uh, the full agenda, um, the, the issue of uh, photo radars come up uh, in the media over the last couple of days, weeks. So I've asked uh, Chris Brinkman, who is acting on behalf of uh, Phil Andre, just to come up to the front and give a very brief verbal update as where the city is on photo radar. Um, so if you could do that, Chris. Yeah, yeah, now, thanks. So basically what we're looking for, Chris, is some clarification in terms of where the process stands now, what the city has done, and if the city still is required to do anything further, or if it's now in the hands of the province. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning. Now, just a very quick update. Um, the matter does reside with the province right now. They have passed the um, enabling legislation for automated speed enforcement in the province. Um, it is restricted within school zones and community safety zones. Um, staff do have participation um, from uh, participating with other municipalities, with the province, um, legal representation, technical representation as we work towards rolling this out. Um, uh, the working groups are currently committed to trying to roll out the program in 2019. That's the goal. Um, the city has been collecting speed data in all of our school zones to assist with a data collection project stemming from the working groups that have been um, put together. Uh, we've completed 72 of our 370 schools and will continue data collection in September in hopes to have it completed before the winter of 2018. Um, 
At this time, it's still sort of unclear as to what automated speed enforcement deployments will look like, whether it will be a trailer versus vehicle mounted or both. I've seen some in other jurisdictions that do both or permanent units in the field. So this is being looked at within the context of the various working groups. And so that kind of summarizes very high level as to where we stand right now. So working with the province, working with our other partners to get this rolling for next year. So in a nutshell, in terms of the committee and council, we've done what we need to do. We're just waiting on the province to finalize. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Chris. So the first item on our agenda then is there was a request to lift the pavement markings on roadways inquiry by Councilor Dean. We will have to have two-thirds in favor of that. Okay. So it's lifted. And I guess if we could have staff come to the table on the issue of the pavement painting. And you don't have a presentation, so I guess we'll just hear from Councilor Dean as to her questions or concerns. Well, thank you for the report. I appreciate it. And, you know, it raised some questions in my mind. I think mostly around how you determined what the path forward would be for pavement markings. I mean, I appreciate that you recognize we have a problem, and it's a problem that needs to be addressed in the city. But there were a lot of suggestions in the report, and I have done some looking across North America and how other municipalities are handling the similar problems. I mean, since 2012, when the federal government made a change to low VOC paint, it seems like across Canada anyway. Sorry. Across Canada anyway, this is a problem that many municipalities face. I think Ottawa in particular has a problem because of our relatively harsh winters and the impact on pavement markings. But in the report, you suggested purchasing a second vehicle, which sounds like a good idea to me, but also you suggested focusing on arterial roadways only and doing striping on those twice annually. But you also did note that other municipalities are looking at different paint products that might be better, and I noted that some municipalities are taking a different approach, which is actually carving out the center line and embedding it. So I'm just wondering how you came to a decision of what you would recommend to the 2019 budget. Through the chair, there are a lot of different options that we can consider with pavement markings. We've given you five or probably four sort of high-level alternatives and given you rough cost estimates to get there. There are other options or combinations of those different things that we can provide. Generally speaking, in the industry, as you've mentioned, other municipalities, other government agencies that do this are having troubles with the paint products. It's an old way of doing things, and with the change in paint that was imposed on us, the paint formulations that was imposed on us through the federal government, the new paints just aren't lasting as long. And I think that's what we're seeing out there. So in our consultation with a number of government agencies that we've spoken to and Transportation Association of Canada and whatnot, most municipalities are looking at moving toward more durable markings, at least for some of their markings. So if we did that, for example, on the arterial roads, would we still need to paint them twice a year, or would once be enough? No. If you use a durable marking, once should be enough. Okay. So generally speaking, the types of durable markings we're talking about might last a year, two years, somewhere in that range. So there may be some savings down the line in terms of, you know, I don't have to go back and paint that road every single year. I might be able to paint it once and then wait two years before I go back and paint it. I don't think we're going to get there. 
I think we're going to be in a place where we're going to have, even though we're using durable markings, they'll provide a better product. It'll be brighter. It will last more through the winter. But you're still going to have to paint it every year. Okay. And so even if we used a more durable paint product, you would still feel that we needed that second vehicle, one painting vehicle. Yes. Uh, currently, we have one paint truck that does the entire city. Yeah, it surprised me. For 6,000 kilometers of road, one truck doesn't seem like very much. Most uh, people we talk to are surprised when we tell them that. Uh, it's a very full program for us. But yeah. the, the existing paint truck that we have uh, and the new one that we're purchasing that we're expecting soon uh, can't do the durable markings. You need a different type of paint truck to do that. Oh, so we would have to purchase a new so, one for durable markets. That's correct. So then you would still be using the old, less effective paint product on uh, all of the other streets other than arterials. And you would use the new, more durable markings on that truck on arterials? Is that what you have? That's one of the options and probably the suggestion that we would go with. Okay. Um, what I would like to do is direct you between now and when we get into the 2019 budget process um, to do a cost-benefit analysis of all of the options and the costs and the benefits so that we could see, you know, laid out before us before we make a decision on where we're going to go in the budget because there are some significant budget implications here. Um, so what I would like you to do is a cost-benefit analysis to give us a sense of um, from that smoothest board of options, what would make the most sense going forward? Is that something you'd be prepared to do? Uh, yes, we can do that. Thank you. Those are my uh, questions. Yeah, that's interesting, Councilor Deans, because we're, we're on the same page. Because what I was going to direct staff to do uh, was along those lines, but in addition, um, we just talked about photo radar, and while that's not in play yet, it will be in 2019. Um, so I'd like to direct staff uh, to go back and uh, when we uh, pass photo radar, we talked about those funds being used for traffic calming and road safety initiatives. So I'd like to direct staff to, uh, in addition to what's been asked of Councillor Deans, to look at the opportunity of, of how and how much of those funds we might be able to access in order to, for example, buy another paint truck or try a more durable uh, 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 product that would last longer on the roads. And in addition to looking at that, I'd also look at the applicability of that source of funding as well uh, to uh, another matter we're going to deal with a little bit later, but the, uh, uh, the gateway speed signage as to whether we can enhance that budget as well and use the photo radar um, funds as a, or, uh, as a uh, as a funding as a funding mechanism. Um, so that, that work, and we can roll those two uh, directions together. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Just ask one question. Yes, absolutely. Remember, I think this question might be too legal, but uh, I know in some programs we, uh, I think in police budgets, we we can't actually um, take the revenues from uh, fines and direct them. They have to go into general revenue. So it, would there be any impediment to directing the proceeds from photo radar to these programs? I think, Mr. Chair, uh, the, the council raised a good point. We'll work with operational staff to include that as part of the uh, submission for budget purposes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. As I say, the, the direction was based on the discussions that we had at the time when we passed that, where we said we were going to use those funds uh, for road safety uh, and road calming, uh, or traffic calming, rather. So that's where that direction comes from. So I'm hoping the answer to that will continue to be yes, Mr. Clerk. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll wait to answer your answer to that. Uh, so the, the next uh, council that wanted to speak to the matter was uh, Councillor Forty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll begin where you're, uh, where you're ending here. I, I'm, I'm not privy to what are the legal parameters, and I think they're important because we're all interested in line painting. We're all interested in uh, additional safety in our school zone near parks. Uh, we have a small traffic calming budget. Like, could we get maybe a briefing note as to what's the extent of the funds from photo radars and how we can use them? Because 
I know that that's been pre, you know, a conversation around this, uh, this committee table relating to some of our traffic calming funds and other funds, exa example PXOs. We have some, uh, we all have some in our world that are in the queue as we, I guess, have one, we see about one a year. So is it possible to ask the clerk uh, to get a briefing on to what are the parameters around photo radar so that we actually can include it holistically to, to uh, uh, in terms of funds? I think Mr. Mancone wants to speak to that uh, question. John? Mr. Chair, I think to, to assist in this regard, certainly we'll do everything uh, both you and the two councillors have asked for in terms of the cost, benefit, and options and scenarios. I think we segregate that from funding. Let's, uh, we'll give you the information on the program elements, and then I will speak to the treasurer on uh, the budget directions report, because I think that's the right venue for you to discuss where you want to direct the, any revenue stream and where you can direct it and vis-a-vis -vis all the other priorities, because certainly there's been a lot of discussions in that regard in terms of where this money will come from. Uh, so we'll bring you both pieces if, if that works for you, but I would just recommend you put the funding over to the, uh, the budget directions report with, uh, with the treasurer. And, and, uh, and Mr. McConey, in light of this being an election year and what have you, when would, when would the budget directions report be coming forward? Because the timeline changes a little bit in election year. It, it does. I don't have that timing for you. I know the treasurer is working with the city manager mapping that out, uh, so um, I don't have that right now. But it is on that altered schedule, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilor Poirier, or... Uh, I'm not completed. I have questions to stop, okay. but just okay. on that element, so you're confirming that you come back, give the, the range of parameters as a, as a, a memo to this committee uh, ahead of, basically after, uh, and when the new council kicks in, but ahead of the budget discussions. Is that kind of the range? Uh, Rick, uh, the city solicitor is nodding yes, as we've done in the past, so you'll have the budget directions report. Perfect. And it will include traffic calming, uh, PXOs, and others. I mean, it will, I guess what I'm saying is it will include the range of funding options that we could decide, and then this committee can, can decide where the priority rests. Is that, is that, is that We will certainly work with the Treasurer to bring all the funding uh, revenue streams forward, and then there has to be obviously a discussion from uh, the various committees as to the priorities for next term of council in that regard. Perfect. Thank you. On the item of the paint, uh, first and foremost, I, I, I want to thank uh, the team because I, I know Councillor Deans was highlighting. I've gone on the ground with the team. I've done a video blog in the past. Uh, you're working overnight, and uh, you know they, they do it. And safety is the the first and foremost uh, as to the work they do. Uh, even at night, it can be challenging environments uh, to uh, to do the work. So I tip my hat off to uh, to yourselves and the crew out there. Uh, you know, doing the work. I think from a committee perspective, there's a few elements. One which is, you know, are you able to confirm that we're, uh, we're meeting and exceeding the, the safety standards uh, relating to our obligation for road safety and, and line painting in that context? Uh, through the chair, I think um, we're meeting our program requirements. So we have a policy that says we will paint once a year, and we believe we can meet that. Is that meeting your requirements from a safety perspective? Is, is that your question? Or? Yeah, I, I'm not an yeah. engineer, so yeah. I, I'm looking uh, to you and other experts to be able to, able, able to confirm to this committee that, you know, get great if we're meeting the policy, but that we're meeting the safety requirements, the obligations that we have uh, as a city. I, I would point to some of the statistics in the report that say that there aren't very many uh, crashes in the city that are related to faded pavement markings. Uh, so I, I think we're doing well in that sense. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of the, the, the there's an illusion or there's a description in the in the briefing relating to a more expensive paint. I might be simplifying the words here because I, I just took my notes from uh, from there, but. There's an element of cost benefit, but there's an element of value too. I mean, if, if we're able to have a durable paint, even if we have to come back every year, if, if the extent of that life gets us through, through the winter and through the early spring, because right now the complaints we get, and I'm sure I'm looking around the table, is in the spring, the lines are gone after the snow's melted. 
and, and then there's the period where you have to do the, the sweeping, you have to wait till uh, all everything's melted and everything's you know ready to go before your team goes out. I get that, but that period is very st stressful uh, for our main streets, for our arterials, and so on, where. Uh, the visibility of you know what corridor and it might act as a traffic calming, but certainly uh, in that context, the safety should uh, should prime. So I, I'm concerned about a cost benefit will only give us um, the, the value, the financial value, and the time component. But I'm wondering if you could extend that and, and actually look at if we are to pay a bit more for the paint, a, a more quality paint, are we able to carry through? to the following spring, right? And, and right now, we can say that a lot of our, our paint just doesn't last through the winter. Yeah, through the chair, our greatest amount of wear occurs through that winter period. So we come out of the winter with a lot of lines that are in uh, less than ideal shape. If you move to a durable marking, uh, you will get much better performance from those markings. They will be in much better shape when you come out of the winter and they should last uh, in an acceptable condition until we can get to restriping them that year. Um, we did use to, you know, we had our oil-based paints prior to 2012. They lasted better. They performed better. And so when we came out of the winter uh, season, our paints looked better and they lasted longer. And for the most part, we didn't get as many complaints because they, you know, uh, markings that were put down in August the previous year were still okay and acceptable in August of the following year. We don't have that anymore with our current paint products. Okay. And the more durable paint, I don't know the name of that product, that is more expensive, but it, you, uh, you seem to allude that it, it would cover... Uh, would it be in, uh, an improved condition over that period? Yes, that's correct. My final question, Mr. Chair, uh, relates to uh, the second truck. So I guess you're alluding in, in the memo or in the briefing and in the inquiry response that you will be putting forward a budget pressure coming uh, to uh, the 2019 budget relating to additional equipment. Uh, that that is you're, you're kind of flagging it, saying, hey, on my in terms of my perform in terms of our performance, we see the need for it. Um, my biggest concern, so I'm okay with that, and let, you know, let's make sure that we're meeting our standards and, and policy, and that uh, the safety on our road uh, for all users is is, uh, is, is prim primary. I guess my concern is we've had over the last few years breakdowns in that truck. It's normal use and so on. So do we have a replacement program for our existing equipment? Because I, I'm worried that, yeah, I mean, I don't want to create an illusion that we bring in a new vehicle that will, will be up and fresh and new, but we have an existing equipment that is aging. So I, I want to know what, what's the strategy around that piece. And through the chair, yes, we have a, a new truck scheduled for delivery actually this September that will eventually replace the existing vehicle, which is 13 years old. So, uh, and then supplementing that with a second vehicle as part of a, a future budget pressure would definitely put us in a stronger position. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Cherishenko. Yes, thank you. I think uh, my colleagues have already um, made the important points uh, about information we still don't have and are going to need, and I wanted to support the direction they've given, um, but I did want to underline, rather than ask some questions, I want to underline a couple of points that I think are important that, uh, that we do cover. Um, I think it's essential that we not stick with this designation of arterial as some black and white um, distinction versus others because there are many cases where I can think of in my ward and elsewhere where uh, the lack of a center line, the lack of a stop bar, the lack of a bike lane marker or the shero uh, or, or many other things um, cause confusion which causes a, a, a feeling of, of, of uh, a vulnerability. Uh, uh, and may even cause, uh, create an excuse for a driver who did not see the stop bar and yet also didn't see the stop sign or the stop sign 50 meters ahead marking. Um, so the point I'm trying to get to is that um, perhaps 
the distinction would be more identifying where there is significant wear and tear uh, as opposed to is it arterial and is it resi you know, a residential road um, because we may find there are arterial locations where the lines are holding up quite well but residential or you know, uh, uh, roads where, where they're not. So um, I think I would like some kind of commentary on what you come back with uh, on the ability to um, identify pavement markings that are wearing away quite quickly and, and not be tied to this idea as is it arterial or, or not. As, as I've already said, I think we may, we may lose some important safety uh, um, needs and opportunities uh, if we do that. Uh, so quite, quite clearly, um, we, we've all seen um, anecdotally as opposed to scientifically uh, that this switch to the new paint um, isn't working in terms of the expectations, uh, our own expectations as councillors and, and our constituents. Um, but I do want to say that uh, it comes from the right place in the sense that those, those VOC paints uh, have significant impacts. Um, you know, the, the stop sign that's right out, out front of my, my window, I, I, I love it when they come and paint the lines, but I don't love it in the middle of the night when my bedroom is full of VOC paint fumes, um, which is how it used to be. We had to jump up and close all the windows in the house, uh, and that, of course, has impacts the atmosphere or ozone layer as well. So it comes from the right place. It's pushed municipalities to find alternatives, uh, and, and I look forward to working with staff to figuring out what those are. Something better than what we have now, but not going back to VOCs. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have Councilor Wilkinson on the list, but just a quick question to follow up. When, when the federal government made the change to the regulations, was that tied in any way to any financial assistance to cities to adjust to the need to either paint more or buy different and more expensive uh, supplies to do the job with different equipment? Was, was there any transitional money, any, any aid to uh, help cities adjust to the new program? Through the chair, I, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one, one of the things I think you have to take into account for an aging population, uh, as I already know, your eyesight isn't as good as you get older, and those white lines, especially on the side of the road, are crucial. And I think uh, it's really important. In the winter time, it gets to be dangerous for the drivers, and I've heard this from many, and I've noticed it myself as well. So I just want, whatever you're coming up with, I think we are going to have to budget enough to provide for it. I think that's something for my council colleagues as well, not only because of the general safety then, but because we have a rapidly aging population, many of whom can drive quite long, a long time. I've just had to take that driving test, and even though my eyes are as good as it used to be, it's still enough to drive. And, uh, and it's incredibly important for uh, ensuring safety. And that just, if you can get one that lasts through the winter, <laughs> it would be so much desired. I mean, there's nothing more, we all hear it. I know every spring you can't see where anything is because the paint's gone. So I look forward, if you're not in council, I will be looking at this report. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Kakish. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I do agree with Councillor Chernyshenko about the residential smaller streets where it can be a little more dangerous, whereas with the arterials or the bigger roads, you'll see other uh, signs that would bring you to a halt, whereas in the residential, sometimes trees or other things um, can be a bit misleading. Uh, my question is with regards to uh, you know the timelines from when I see you have a lot of numbers and a lot of information here. Um, with regards to um, getting back to those service requests, what's on average the, the time between when we get a SR request and when it's actually completed? Uh, through the chair, that, that varies uh, quite a bit depending on the location and depending on how we prioritize the work at that location. Uh, so if, if we find that the markings in a particular area are 70% worn, we will prioritize that location over another area where the markings are only 30% worn. Um, if you're asking for an average, I don't have an exact number, but I'm going to say it's probably in the six to eight week range. Okay. The 
The other thing that um, I've also encountered, because I have a lot of new development in my area, as you know, and whether it's Riverside South or Leitrim, is a lot of the time we see these new subdivisions built and then the, the markings aren't there. I know there's obviously construction, and until that construction is complete and the lots are developed and it's handed back to the city, nobody really wants to um, you know, take ownership of that. So in some instances we have to do that. Who's overseeing that process where it's still under development? Do you guys work with them or is that just a development uh, shop that ensures that the safety is, is um, up to par with regards to new subdivisions that are missing paintings and that sort of thing? Because I've had that in a few uh, pockets in my ward. Through the chair, the, um if we get work orders from development services indicating what pavement markings are required in subdivisions, and we'll respond to those as soon as those subdivisions are ready. So typically in a subdivision, they'll put the base course of asphalt in, and the responsibility for any markings when you have base course rests with the developer. When the final lift of asphalt goes in, then it becomes our responsibility to put those in. The other thing I would note is that not every stop sign location in a new subdivision automatically gets stop bars. So what is the criteria that would determine that in a four-way stop, for example? Uh, four-way stops should always have markings, uh, always have stop bars and crosswalk markings. The criteria are, are the bus routes for non-always non stops or two-way stops. And the criteria is, uh, is there a bus route there? Uh, what designation road is it? Is it a, are you coming to a stop at a collector road versus a local road? So, and that's a gauge of how much traffic is there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I don't believe we have any more questions on this item. Uh, so the next uh, item uh, on inquiries that was asked to be lifted was uh, park and cycle spaces. Uh, we need to take a vote on that. Two thirds in favor. So I'm going to ask, thank you, I'm going to ask the Vice Chair to introduce the substitute motion uh, in this matter. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Do you want me to read out the entire thing? I think so. It would be helpful. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, whereas at its meeting of June 27, 2018, a motion has been brought forward requesting that staff implement interim measures to accommodate West End suburban residents who wish to drive to a municipal park uh, parking lot, a municipal park parking lot inside the Green Belt, park their vehicle for the day, and cycle to work. And council referred this issue to the transportation committee for consideration. And whereas encouraging residents to cycle to work instead of driving, even if it is for only a part of their journey is supportive of the city's goal to increasing cycling mode share, and whereas park parking lots are provided for the exclusive use of park users, and whereas the zoning for parks and recreation facilities generally does not allow parking for non-insular uses, and whereas restrictions on parking are an important mechanism for ensuring that parking priority is maintained for facility users, and whereas removal of parking restrictions could lead to the growth in unauthorized use of municipal parking lots at key locations, if not accompanied by an appropriate policy framework and control measures, Whereas sufficient time is required to confirm the feasibility of the concept, review its applicability on a citywide basis, develop a program framework and controls and consult with the public as appropriate on the zoning changes required to accommodate a change in parking restrictions. Therefore, be it resolved that the Transportation Committee recommend council direct staff of the Transportation Services Department and Recreation, Cultural and Facility Services to undertake a review of the park and bike concept and report back with findings and recommendations by the end of Q1 2019. Thank you very much for introducing that. I have a quick question for the clerk. Um, uh, Mr. Clerk, we have lifted the inquiry and we have the substitute uh, motion, which was uh, a replacement motion for the motion that was on the agenda and referred from council. Um, I'm just wondering, do we deal with this all in one piece, or do people speak to the inquiry and then deal with the motion? And to add to the mix, just to make it a little bit more confusing, we do have a public delegation that wishes to speak 
uh, to the motion, uh, but not the replacement motion, but the, 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 the original motion. I think, Mr. Chair, past practice with a number of other committees has been when you're importing uh, such inquiry responses that you deal with them just in the regular course of the overall debate and discussion. There's no need to separate them out. And we would deal with the public delegation first before we go to councillors and questions? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. So I believe we only have one public delegation on this matter, and that is uh, Dorothy Dalton-Smith. Is Ms. Smith here? If you come forward, thank you. Good morning, and you have uh, five minutes to make your presentation. My name is Dorothy Dalton Smith, and I'm currently a resident of Canada North, longtime resident of the Crystal Beach, Britannia area, so I'm familiar with the parks in question. I was asked by Councillor Wilkinson to speak to the Transportation Committee regarding the Park and Cycle motion under consideration. I first contacted the Councillor after reading Patrick Pierce's letter in the Citizen earlier this summer, which outlined an apparent crackdown by the city when a number of cars were ticketed in West End Parks. When I called the City of Ottawa to have the parking regulations for the city parks clarified, I was surprised to have confirmed that indeed the parking lots at city parks are only to be used by those that plan to utilize the park in the moment. When I asked whether bicyclists to use the toilet facilities in the park, refill water bottles at fountains in the park, and then travel to work or recreation on pathways that run through several contiguous parks would fit this category, I was informed that we would not. The bylaw requires users to remain in the park. I have lived and worked in Ottawa since 1980 and have long been a supporter of cycling in the park. I parked my car at Andrew Hayden Park to commute to work near Holland Avenue and then Broadview Avenue for over 30 years. When I arrived at the parking lot between 7 and 7.30 a.m., there was always plenty of parking. When I returned between 4 and 4.30 p.m., there was still plenty of parking. Since retiring five years ago and moving to Canada, I park at the Nepean Sailing Club, Andrew Hayden Park, or Britannia Park in the mid-morning. Find plenty of spots available, bicycle for a few hours, and return in the mid to late afternoon to a nearly empty lot. I've recently taken photos that can attest to this. In my experience of these parking lots, there's a slight traffic increase to use the water park mid-morning to mid-afternoon and during special events. But the usual situation is that there is plenty of parking to go around throughout the day. Commuter traffic clears out of the lots between 4 and 5 p.m., leaving plenty of room for the evening users of the park to find parking spots. I understand that the current motion will set aside 10 parking spots for cyclists. I am not yet sure how this motion will look when it rolls out, but I do hope that the committee will keep these concerns of cyclists as their main focus. Number one, these parking spots are necessary because we arrive at the pathways from all over the region in order to work or enjoy recreation in Ottawa. This has the advantage of reducing vehicle traffic in the downtown core. Number two, many of us would like to access the pathways efficiently and safely while avoiding roadways where it is common to see speeds of 80 kilometers an hour, poor pavement, and bike lanes that end without warning. Number three, regulations that require users to remain in the parking lot for a limited period of time should be eliminated. Number four, cyclists should be able to park and bicycle to other areas of the city along the pathways rather than remain in the park. Number five, put in place supports for all cyclists and commuters in the region, as well as those that live closer to the core. Number six, continue a program of improvements to the network, please. Number seven, develop an education component to reduce the negative interactions between drivers and cyclists. 
The bicycle paths in Ottawa are a world-class treasure that have been receiving some well-needed updates of late. As the city builds on its reputation as a strong cycling advocate, we need to ensure that policies reflect the needs of the users of this infrastructure and that access and safety remain utmost in the minds of policymakers. Thank you for your time and the work that you do on behalf of the city. And thank you for your presentation. Any questions for the delegation? Councillor Wilkinson. Mr. President, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, you say you've been doing this for 30 years, I think I heard you say. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a ticket for doing this? I've never had a ticket for doing this. Yeah. So this has been, I don't know what, what happens with the, uh, when you have a long-term use. I know with private property, sometimes it's been used for a long time. You've got to go keep on using it to, because it's gained the right to use it. And I don't know if the legal people can say, if people have been doing something for 30 years without anybody objecting to it, does that, in fact, override the zoning and give them the right to use it? No, Mr. Chair. I, I, I've actually have known in some cases where over 30 years of that happening, that land has actually transferred from one owner to another. By uh, It doesn't apply to, prop, to public property, I guess, is the problem. There. The, um, so this is something that is... is Numbers there, you've never seen a problem with parking there because you've used the parks? Never. And I, I've used those parking lots at different times during the day. There has never been an issue around parking unless there's a special event going on in the middle of the day. So okay. there's a, a community picnic, that sort of thing. Does that happen very often during the week? Uh, not that I have noticed in the five years since I've been retired. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that are, uh, is all of our public delegations. Uh, so we'll move to uh, move to questions. Um, uh, I have a couple to start off. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Dan uh, Shaney is going to come forward, and and I believe we did. We just lose the clerk and city solicitor. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't see uh, over, uh, over, Shad's, uh, over Shad's head. Sorry. Um, so just a couple of quick questions, Mr. O'Connor. So building on the response you just gave to, to Councillor Wilkinson, just so everybody's on the same page. So to implement parking, bike parking at the city parking, uh, city park lots uh, would require a zoning change. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. I went back and uh, checked with Tim Mark, Senior Legal Counsel. He's at a hearing this morning, but he confirmed that, yes, in fact, that would require a zoning change. And would that process then take part of this discussion anyway um, uh, to the Planning Committee? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Okay, I, I may have other I may have other questions uh, down the road, but that's that, that's the start. So the first um, uh, counselor on the list is uh, Councillor Flurry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd like to begin first and foremost by uh, thanking our dean on council, Marianne Wilkinson, to bring forward the the item here. I, you know, uh, too often do we hear of a, a generation gap in terms of active transit use, and I think. Uh, Marianne has been, uh, you know, a leader in, in forcing the city in terms of innovation and in terms of those uh, discussions. So, Marianne, thanks for bringing us to committees uh, on the floor of committee today. Um, I'm, I'm of the mindset that we do have to have a, f a fuller, a fulsome review um, of this issue. We want to facilitate uh, access uh, to cycling. Uh, for those who can and, and want to, uh, I'm of the mindset uh, that city lots, that uh, schools, that private lots could all be uh, part of the solution and I would love for us to, um, to do a public call out through uh, public, inc public uh, information uh, to engage with those who own surface lots 
outside of the peak periods to see if there are additional capacity, if there's ways that the city can partner uh, and, and do this holistically. Because uh, you know, uh, today it's, it's in the uh, Kanata area, but it could really apply to most uh, of, the, of our communities, and there might be underused lots where there are uh, these opportunities. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, I can, Mr. Chair, give direction that as part of this uh, discussion today that we ask staff to come back uh, with uh, an engagement strategy to engage our school boards, to engage and do our own real estate review in terms of our parking lots and private lots to do uh, what I'll call a, a park and ride. A park and ride, uh, ride your bike, and uh, I think that uh, reduces congestion. I think that uh, facilitates uh, the access to biking. And um, I, was, I was speaking to the general manager of um, Parks Rec, Culture, and Leisure Den. I, I don't have the exact wording anymore, but uh, the, um, I, I do support uh, Marianne's point around the 10 spots for today. I would do it as a, in my mind, as a pilot uh, for us to just, you know, we have a request today. Let's do it as a pilot. Let's put a, a review and let's do a fulsome review uh, of, of that, uh, of those opportunities. I do see the risk. The risk is that we have special events hosted in our parks. Uh, that don't have a, a, a weekly reoccurrence or a daily reoccurrence that we might not then be able to, to access, which is counter to our goals of, of offering parks, leisure, and that access. So I, I do think that there's a hybrid of three, which is let's do a fulsome review. Let's create this as a, as a form of a pilot for, for 10 spots for a, a given window of time and uh, let's engage uh, uh, our folks at Parks and Rec and Culture for the bigger conversation because I wouldn't want to limit access to our parks, which would be counter uh, to those green space and, and those leisure investments. So that's, that's how I feel about it, and uh, certainly we'll, uh, we'd love to, to engage with committee members on it. Thank you for that. I, I believe the wording of the motion is broad enough to take in that direction. It, it, it simply speaks to a review of the park and bike concept and report back with findings and recommendations. So I think, Mr. Shenley, that what's been suggested by Councillor Fleury uh, in that regard works. Um, uh, I, I'm willing to hear full debate, but I, I certainly do have concerns about partitioning out 10 random spots without any kind of public consultation, without any kind of review, a hearing from legal counsel that in fact we need a zoning change to do that. So there are, there are a lot of moving parts here, um, but I think I think this is, is still a win this morning. We have a new idea in front of us. We, have, we don't have staff saying no, certainly, to it. We have staff saying it's an interesting idea, we want to put some resources into figuring how it's going to work. And if they came back to us on the timeline suggested, which is Q1 of 2019, um, a more uh, inclusive, a more uh, thought-out approach to everything from licensing to choosing who gets to park and where they get to park and under what circumstances and everything else, as well as dealing with the zoning issue, uh, we could likely have a, a more fulsome process or pilot in place uh, for the spring of uh, 2019. So um, I may have more to say on it uh, later. Um, the uh, next speaker on the list, uh, I believe, is, uh, is Councillor uh, Chernyshenko. Thank you very much. I, I, I certainly like what I'm, I'm hearing from everyone, and I believe there is a, there is a compromise, there's a way forward that is going to work. Often it's said in bureaucracies the best way to kill a good idea is to acknowledge it's a good idea and go out and study it more. Um, but in this case, I think we do have to study it more, but not necessarily use that as an impediment to start piloting while we're doing that. Um, I, and I thank the speaker because she does raise her own personal experience, one that I've <clears throat> frequently, it's my own experience often, but I think what we are seeing, what we are likely to see is a distinction between people who drive to the park in order to go for a recreational bike ride as opposed to the need that we're hearing from a lot of people, which is if I had a parking spot which was closer into the core where I'm working um, but allowed me to do a reasonable bike ride, I would do that as part of my commute on a daily basis. And should we have 
10, 15, 20 parking spots in our parks being used on a daily basis as part of people's commute uh, and being occupied for the entire day, I think that's very different than someone who comes, parks there, goes for a two, three, four, or even five hour bike ride um, a couple of times a week uh, and, uh, and all of the issues that then come with this being a, a regular use. Uh, um, the chair has mentioned some of those, you know, who gets them, how early do you have to get in line for them, is there a cost to them, um, is there a pass required, who's checking them, um, uh, you know, all of those, all of those what ifs that we do want to think through in order to, to do this right. But in the end, where do we want to get to as a city, uh, a place where more people who, who would uh, cycle uh, as part of their daily activity, um, doing it more often because we've helped to make it easier for them and perhaps cheaper as well. Uh, is there a solution in there that meets all those needs? Uh, I hope so. Possibly some compromises in some areas, um, but I like, I like where this notion is going and if it is compatible to do a pilot, um, I didn't catch whether that was for this year uh, or, uh, or the beginning of, uh, of next year to see are these problems really arising, are they imagined? Uh, I imagine it will be depend, you know, it will be case by case locations. Um, I think we can find a way to, uh, um, to making this work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to Councillor Wilkinson for uh, bringing this forward. Um, you know, we, uh, for those of us who um, represent downtown, uh, you know, inner urban wards, congestion is uh, a serious issue that we, you know, we struggle with always, and we need to encourage multi modes of uh, transportation. And uh, we know that uh, uh, for folks coming in from the outskirts, certainly transit is key. But uh, if we can find a way for people to, uh, to cycle into the downtown rather than, you know, taking their cars in, uh, we have to not just applaud that, but do what we can to facilitate it and, and ensure that uh, uh, that it uh, that it works. But as you know, some of my colleagues pointed out, there is. Uh, you know, we do have to give some consideration to uh, the use of uh, those parking spots today. And my understanding is that um, a pilot, even if we decided today, let's go ahead with a pilot for 10 spots, um, that would require a zoning change. Is that correct? And we can't do that here. That would need to go to planning. Um, and then to council after that. So, you know, if I, you know, just kind of thinking it through, um, it's uh, these, the pathways that we're, that we're talking about that are being traveled mostly, I, I would imagine, are the NCC pathways that are not cleared in the winter. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that's correct, Councillor, that for the most part we're talking about uh, pathways that would and be open by certainly by December uh, and given the time for a zoning change for the public consultation to take place uh, you'd probably be looking at you know certainly probably more than a month into the fall before we were even at that point of getting it on to council um, so I think staff's preference would be that if we're going to do this it would be in, as, as a spring pilot Okay. Well, that, it certainly makes sense, and I, you know, I think that the the motion that we have in front of us will uh, get us to where Councillor Wilkinson and uh, her residents, you know, want us to want us to go. Um, the direction from Council Fleury, uh, you know, certainly is important. I think that we do have to look at a lot of different, you know, many different options. We've got. Uh, you know, some of my colleagues were just saying, you know, school uh, parking lots that are empty. We've got uh, some of the parking lots are NCC parking lots. I mean, it's uh, it's not just we're not just going to be looking at at the one parking lot. So um, I think that this can be done. I think it'll be done very low cost. Um, a great way to you know to provide facilities for for parking. Um, so I'm going to obviously 
uh, strongly support the, the motion uh, to get a uh, report back. Look forward to that report and we'll be um, uh, you know, very much uh, in favor of finding um, uh, a good option that allows people to, to park and cycle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, next is uh, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, going back on the, the business of the usage, et cetera, they, they used to be, is it, uh, uh, is the lawyer still here? Yeah. Oh, we used to have, I know that squatter's rights exist because I've seen it used. And it was a 30-year period, and if they used it for 30 years, then they got land. And I had, I know of a place where that actually was used to get some land. So do, uh, does squatter's rights not apply to parks? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, squatters' rights are, are a, a different principle uh, that relate to ownership of the property. They don't relate to the use of a property. And so uh, that question would be separate from the zoning, the issue of zoning. Um, and uh, zoning is tied to the use of a property. Um, so if someone is conducting a use that's not permitted under the zoning of a property, it's still contrary to the, the zoning bylaw. I've known it not to be used for rights because in England, for example, where this comes from, there are many, many pathways that go across private property that their right to use them is on, whether it's called squatter rights or something, is because it's a long-term use. They don't actually get changed to the ownership of the land. It is a use change. So that's, is that not the case in Canada as well? Um, it, it, it is the case with respect to easements and certain property rights that, and that used to be the case in Ontario um, when there was a transfer of the land title system from the previous registry system into uh, its current system. Uh, the ability to acquire those rights uh, was essentially eliminated for all new properties going forward. Uh, so it, it, it's also a little bit different than what we're talking about here, which is a, a publicly owned property that the public has access to. Um, and, and so it's, I think what you're talking about is, is the right of access that's acquired over time and the right to cut across someone's property to access one's own property, um, which again is not the case here. So it, it doesn't apply. Yeah. So, right. After 50 years, we suddenly got one parking, some parking tickets given for parking on private property. Now, I always thought our parks were public property. And um, I, I'm going to encourage anybody who gets any of these tickets to go to the provincial court if, in, until we get this finished, because it's going to be there's a time lag right now for what it looks like. Um, to actually go out to the court and say this is public property and I'd see if they can get that waived. And I know by talking to, to Mr. Shanley that they are not asking the bylaw to go and ticket them and things like that. And as far as I know, there haven't been any tickets since then. And I know people are still going there. They're trying the other park that you suggested it with some difficulty too because it's a little bit further and you get caught in congestion to get there. Um, and so I'm hoping that people will just generally use it this fall because once winter comes, they tend not to anyway. Uh, the one that's a quite, I think it's an important thing in doing the study, and I have no objection to it. I wanted this to be a pilot and then to go on to do exactly what this motion is saying, to take a look at, at where we can do these. For the point of view of people going on cycling, the, the parks obviously have to be near cycling routes, and these ones happen to be on a many major cycling routes, so that the park, you can park there, the cycling route's right there, and it takes you right downtown or to Westboro or to a lot of different places. Not, not everybody works downtown. And vice versa, somebody working in town who happens to have a car and is trying to get to work in Canada would find it easier to go there and take their bike and bike to Canada because of time to get to Canada now, the traffic out there is so bad that it's taking them 20 to 30 minutes just within Canada to get there, so the bikes go around that. So I think it can work in both directions, not just for coming in, but also for going out, So people going to the airport or various other places. Um, I think it's a healthy way of trying to say, we have a very strange city in a way because we have a green belt. I don't know any other city in the world today that has a, a green belt that is actually the entire area is cut off. The green sp strips and things like that, but not an entire one. That makes the distances much longer. It requires development because the inside of the green belt was designed for 500,000 people. We're almost a million now to go outside. And the growth is happening there. I don't know if you realize it, but the 26.3% of all new people in 2017 moved into Canada Statesville. That's more than a quarter of the whole population of growth of Ottawa. 
And that's causing a lot of congestion and various things. And people like to cycle. So the more we can do to improve it. But as we're going out, those people are further and further away. They're 25, 30, 35 kilometers from downtown. It's an awful long way to go. If you can get that down to 15 to 20, or from the park being 15, then it's a reasonable commute. So I think this is something that is, was brought to me as a problem that some of the community are having. And my job, partly, and so is yours, is when people have a concern and a problem, if we can handle it, then we should. And this is one where we have a lot of parking lots. And I think Councilor Fleury is right, the school parking lots are another one. I have a big picnic every Sunday. I don't ask the school board for permission, but I'll tell you, the high school parking lot's full that day. Um, and there's lots of people we go to places all the time where you may use a school parking lot or a park parking lot or something when you kind of relate it to it in the area, but not necessarily staying in the one spot the whole time. And so it's, it's a good time to take a look at what I will say and also at what we can do to make sure we protect the use of those facilities for what their primary purpose is, because these would be secondary purposes. But having parking lots that we paid for sitting empty when we have people who could use them doesn't make any sense to me, and it doesn't make any sense to do new infrastructure when we don't have to, nor does it make sense to me in doing this study. I hope you won't make it too bureaucratic. I don't think we need as many rules as we sometimes put in place. We don't need to have permits. Councillor, can I ask you to wrap up the other councillors on the list that wish well, to speak to the matter? I just to want to give some ideas to go on in the forward. I could do that later after we do it if you'd rather I did that at the end. You sorry? I could do it at the end to give some suggestions with going on with what... Well, well this is kind of the end. We're, we're, in, we're in the process of having discussions. So, uh, Councillor Codry is next on the list if he's willing to wait a few more minutes. Yeah, I'll then we'll let you I'll finish up. Clear it up a little bit. I think you know, one of the things is that it's we've done it before with park and rides. I think Council Cadre did it with the park and rides. We have a Canadian kind of entire place. You can make changes to ensure that that you have a, an infrastructure that's used for more than one purpose, and it's really important to get that done. It's not something that the um, should be. A, holding up, and I'm glad that the committee and this, what people are saying here today is that they want to try to make sure it can work and that uh, we can deal with it uh, in a little longer. I'm a little concerned about the zoning, though. If we have to wait till the report comes back in Q1 and then you go to do zoning, zonings don't happen in 60 days. They take a lot longer. And I'm, I'm wondering if the staff, if, if it's possible to, as we, if somewhere along the preliminary work of this before it's even finished, if staff are open to it, that you could work on a zoning bylaw amendment that would not just say that the primary use of park ones are, but that we could give some ability to be flexible in saying that the staff city that park staff can, under with change of policy, division, allow other uses to go there, so that we don't end up what's happening now. We wouldn't be able to go in the spring of the zoning. So I'd, I'll leave that with talking to staff uh, offline a little bit and yourself, Mr. Chair, but they think it's something we should take a look at and also talk to the chair. Yeah, I, I would think that, that Mr. Shami can liaise with his uh, his counterpart in planning and find a way to, to minimize the impact time-wise. Yes, Chair, we, we will do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Councillor Codry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I too want to thank uh, Councillor Wilkinson for bringing this interesting idea to the table. Uh, uh, for discussion, and um, you know, in terms of the motion that uh, Councillor Wilkinson had put on the agenda, I think it's a workable motion. The only concern I have is the fact that what other pitfalls lie if we go that road right away immediately. And one of the items that I will bring to the table is the fact that I had a similar situation in my ward, where in the park people started to use their vehicles to park in the park and ride the bus because they from, if they rode from that park, they were able to get a seat on the bus versus if they drove to a park and ride. So there are other pitfalls in terms of when we do things like this, and we have to be very careful. So I like the idea of the committee motion to go back and uh, uh, review the issue and look at all of the other uses that possibly could prop up. Uh, because of the bicycle issue, and uh, I'm okay with the bicycle. I'm willing to support it. Uh, the only concern I have is you have to look at the entire picture, and the entire picture in this particular motion is not there until we look at, do actually do a study, and uh, that is sometimes our biggest uh, downfall as councillors. We put motions on the table, 
which I have done also, uh, where we haven't done a full work on it, or we haven't allowed the staff to go back and look at all of the implications. And the implication I just mentioned, just a small one, but it was affecting park usage during the summer months for soccer and stuff during the day when people were parking to take the bus closer uh, to home type of scenario. Anyways, I'll leave it with the committee, but I will be supporting the committee motion going uh, today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Any other councillors wish to speak to the matter? Um, I'm, I'm going to be supporting the Vice Chair's motion. Uh, I don't disagree with, uh, with Councillor Wilkinson. The law can be a pain sometimes, and uh, it's part of the reason I don't practice anymore. And, uh, but I think we've heard very clearly from, from legal that, that we do require some sort of a variance in the existing zoning. Um, I was happy to hear that, uh, that uh, Mr. Chenier is prepared to liaise, a, liaise with his counterpart in, in uh, planning to make that as painful listen as quick as possible should we decide to go with the pilot um, and uh, so I thank you for that and I thank Councillor Wilkinson for bringing forward the idea which has obviously caught a lot of people's interest and uh, so I'm going to call for the vote on the uh, on the replacement motion all in favor okay okay thank you It's a roulette motion. I don't think that motion actually means the other motion is not in place because the, the original motion was only for a pilot. It wasn't for, it was actually considered having a study done. It was, it was exactly what Councillor Shad said. You don't go in and do it all at once. You try things out. But are you saying that motion by taking it is actually taking away all of the other aspects of it? The committee agreed that it was going to be a substitute motion to that motion, so. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're done, Councillor, um, okay. on, on that so issue. So the only thing people can, if they're going to do it now, they're going to do it knowing that technically they're, they're breaking the zoning bylaw. If bylaw receives a complaint, as you know, it's a reactive service. If they receive a complaint. I think I, think I did hear Dan Cheney say the, the Parks Department are not asking for that while we're doing the study. But, no, but, but there, there, else maybe somebody shows up who wishes to park for purposes of playing soccer or something and, and phones in a complaint and, you know, that's their right. Um, to do that, but no, I think what Mr. Chenier said is you're not asking bylaw proactively to to monitor the park, correct? That's right, Councillor. Um, through my department, there have been very few complaints uh, to this. I suspect that what may have happened earlier in the summer is that residents called in or people that have booked the park and have come across a situation where there was an issue, but um, we don't proactively uh, call in bylaw to, to, to monitor parking lots. They do, I know, go to parks and... and uh, do some monitoring if, if, if there is, uh, as part of their daily work uh, in pretty well all city parks with large parking lots, uh, but we're not going out of our way to call them in specifically for this. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, gateway uh, speed limit signage in residential areas, and we have a brief presentation from staff on that. I believe Mr. Brinkman is going to do the presentation. And we also have a speaker on this particular matter as well. Good morning again. I'd just like to introduce uh, Scott Muir, who is the traffic assessment specialist, who can also provide some support on the report if there's questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, so gateway speed limit signage, just wanted to bring uh, committee members up to date on where we stand with this initiative. So the city's been working with the province for the past nine years to bring forward changes to the Highway Traffic Act that would allow the use of uh, speed limit gateway signage to designate speed limits within neighborhoods. So this is the type of signage that we could now introduce coming into residential neighborhoods as opposed to having to install them on a block by block basis. They would be installed on, the, on what we call the gateways coming into the neighborhoods. Um, the signs depicted here would be required at each entry and, and exit point to the area. So, 
So the city's current speed zoning policy allows for the implementation of 40 kilometer per hour speed limits on local residential roadways through a petition process in established areas and through the site plan process for new subdivisions. Uh, 40 kilometer speed limits can also be implemented on collector roads that meet a set of requirements detailed in the speed zoning policy. Until recently, implementing 40 kilometer per hour speed limits required the installation of a sign every 300 meters and or after every cross street along a roadway. Implementation was done on a street by street basis, often, often leading to similar roadways within the same community having different speed limits. With this new legislation, gateway speed limit signage, signs are only required at the entry and exit points into a specific area, significantly reducing the number of signs required to establish a consistent speed limit in the area. Implementing speed, uh, speed limits on an area level provides more consistency and helps better under, drivers better understand what is expected of them when entering a neighborhood. So how do we designate areas? Uh, staff have undertaken a preliminary review of the entire road network to determine where gateway speed limits should be applied based on guidance provided in the speed zoning policy. Eligible roadways generally include all local residential roadways as well as collector roadways that are currently posted at 40 kilometers per hour. As we move towards implementation, more in-depth review will be completed for each area to determine if there are any opportunities to include more unposted collector roadways into an area based if uh, criteria are met to have a 40 kilometer limit on the road. Likewise, in areas uh, where roadway conditions may meet requirements for 30 kilometer per hour speed limits based on the 30 kilometer per hour speed limit policy, staff will evaluate to see if small pockets of 30 kilometer per hour areas can be introduced. Here's a, an example of, of how something uh, within a, a designated area would look. Um, uh, the area that you see in front of you is in Sandy Hill, defined by Chapel uh, Range and Man Streets. Um, in this example, uh, there would be a total of 30 gateway speed limit signs, which would be introduced on the periphery of the, the area that you see in front of you uh, versus the, the old method which would have required 125 signs that would have had to been installed on individual roadways to enforce the 40 kilometer per hour speed limit. So it's a huge reduction in the number of signs. Implementation. Um, in 2009, when the city's speed zoning policy was approved, $50,000 per year was allocated within the science maintenance budget to implement speed limit changes. The proposed implementation plan for the new gateway signage uh, uh, project would be to implement one area per, per ward between now and the end of 2019 up to a $50,000 per year cap. Uh, consultation with ward councillors would be undertaken to establish priorities. The total cost of implementing gateway signage is estimated at approximately $1.58 million. Um, in all designated areas citywide, uh, at $50,000 per year, uh, that would take us approximately 30 years to accomplish. Uh, staff, however, are currently exploring funding options to to accelerate implementation. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And I hope uh, further to what we were talking about this morning, one of those funding options we're going to look at is uh, potentially accessing the funds from the photo radar program. Um, we do have, before we go to councillors, we do have uh, one speaker, uh, Tammy Lynch, to speak to the matter. So if you could come forward, please. Thank you, Chair Edgley and members of the Transportation Committee for allowing me to speak to Item 2, Gateway Speed Limit Signage in Residential Areas. Uh, today I'm here as a resident of Innis Ward. 
Having worked at, in the Innis Ward office, I've been involved with motions to have speeds reduced on streets in the area, such as Orleans Boulevard and Bearbrook Road. Residents have brought forward petitions to the Council's office after having to canvass their street and obtain the necessary 66% of residential support. The onus on ensuring safe speed limits should not be placed with residents. This is why I fully support the gateway speed limit signage in residential areas. For example, one area of the ward, being the newest area, Bradley Estates, there are several inconsistencies between the speed limit in the community. On the north area of Bradley Estates, called Bradley Bridge, there are 40 kilometer per hour signs posted throughout the subdivision. Across the road on the south side of Bradley Estates, there is no signage at all, which by default means the speed on these local residential roads is 50 kilometers, too fast for a family-oriented community. I would like to see all streets in the Bradley Estates community posted at 40 kilometers per hour. Gateway signage would be ideal for a community such as this. Drivers would know upon entry into the neighborhood what is expected of them. As stated in the report, as only one community per ward would benefit from gateway speed limits by the end of 2019, I want to ensure that neighborhoods such as Bradley Estates are prioritized and the discrepancies between developing, newly developed, and existing communities are removed. While I don't necessarily have a question, I just wanted to ensure that that neighborhood was prioritized. Thank you, Chair and members of committee. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, First speaker on the uh, on the uh, councillors list is uh, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've uh, welcomed this this report. I think that uh, um, Councillor Leeper demonstrated best how um, you know the. The, the process wasn't working. It took uh, over a thousand uh, volunteer hours of, uh, of folks getting petition signs, just to, you know, sign just to get the traffic um, speeds lowered on uh, on one street in uh, in that ward. Um, so I do, you know, I, I do uh, welcome this and. Uh, but for for myself, um, I am always looking for 30 kilometer speed limits. I think that two things have to happen. One is we have to design our roadways uh, so that traffic doesn't travel too fast. Uh, we saw that happen here at this committee through this term. We went down a slippery slope and couldn't stop. Um, you know where we were lowering speed limits where. You know, at least staff were telling us the speed's not going to get lowered. People are not going to drive slower on big, wide roadways, and uh, and that's the that that is the case. So we have to ensure that we're designing our roadways for for lower speeds. Um, but also, when we are you know in the in the downtown and the ward that I represent. Many of these streets, residential streets, are narrow streets. They're now narrower than uh, than some of the newer ones, and 40 kilometers an hour is still too fast. If you're going down a block um, uh, where you know there's uh, any life, <laughs> people are walking, people are cycling, people are living. I can tell you that on a downtown residential street, 40 kilometers is is too fast. Uh, it's too fast to stop on time to hit a, a child, you know, walking out into the street to not to. We have to allow for mistakes. People make mistakes, and as a driver, I don't want my mistake to injure pedestrians or cyclists. And as a cyclist or a pedestrian, I should be able to make a mistake and not risk catastrophic injury or, or death. And we know that 30 kilometers an hour is that sweet spot where the chance of um, uh, surviving catastrophic injury or death is something like 90%. And it, uh, the, the, the difference as you increase speeds 
to your risk of death or injury is is exponential. So um, I'm you know I'm looking forward to uh, gateway areas in in the ward that are 30 kilometer hour gateway areas. So I'm just and I've I've read the report a few times and I you know but I'm I'm. It, it's, it's geared more towards 40 kilometers. So, what is the criteria that that the if if, if I'm the council after the next election and 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 looking to get a gateway speed of 30 kilometers, what does that criteria look like as opposed to the 40? How much more onerous is it? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, through the chair, so the city currently does have a 30 kilometer per hour speed limit policy, and I would suggest that requests for that be made through staff to review that specific street through that lens. Um, like you, like you mentioned, uh, once you set on some facilities, will uh, speed limits artificially low? Perhaps if they're not in in um, in formation with with the street itself, the width of the road, the width of the lanes, the volume of traffic, then you create this discrepancy in speeds, I guess, between the 30 kilometer posted and then whatever the drivers would be probably driving. Um, but that's the case for 40 kilometers as well. So I'm just, I guess my question is, how much more onerous w will it be with this policy uh, to put in place a 30 kilometer gateway as opposed to a 40 kilometer gateway where the warrants, you know, where you, there's a reasonable expectation that cars will travel that speed because the roads are a bit narrower, the residential roadways, we can use traffic calming and other low cost calming, traffic calming measures. Through the chair, uh, like I mentioned, I think we would we would want to look through each street individually through the 30 kilometer per hour policy, because right now the way the gate gateway limit policy is set up uh, is is purely for 40 kilometer per hour zones. But we could look at individual streets within those 40 kilometer per hour pockets and review them under the 30 kilometer per hour separate speed limit policy that the city has established and view them through that lens. But I, that I'm, doesn't make it any easier today. I've been asking for that actually for two years. I'm not, many, many times. I've said, where, where are the streets in my ward that warrant 30 kilometers? And I've never gotten that. So I'm going to be back here, if I'm so lucky, another two years uh, asking for the same thing. So this, this report is not giving me and the residents that I represent who ask for 30 kilometers all the time. People are not interested in 40 for streets like, I mean, can run them off, Poplar, Elm, like all of these small residential streets. People are not looking for 40 kilometer gateways, they're looking for 30 kilometers. So um, I don't see any change uh, that will um, suffice for, for the downtown. Mr. Chair, if I understand the question correctly, I just want to put it back, mm -hmm. is um, can you take the policy and make a 30K the default in a neighborhood should the councillor decide that? Is that correct? Is that's that correct, yes. So uh, my preliminary review is uh, that's not where the space we're in, but I want to go back to legal and have that discussion. I want to get back to you on that, whether or not we can reset the default to 30 uh, for neighborhoods. I don't believe you can, but I want to double check that. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. If you're going to do that work and go back to legal, perhaps you could circulate the answer to all the members of council when, when you get that response from legal? Yeah, I uh, certainly, uh, as Chair, I'll do two things. I'll, I'll, I'll get the answer to that. And then if we can't, because of the legislative change, what would be our recommendation should a councillor want to do that? And, and then there's going to have to be a policy discussion if, if the committee Perfect. wants to do that. So I'll set the, the, the wheels in motion to give you the, that information back. Thank you. Okay, and then that will, we'll have that for council and can make some decisions at council then for, for that. And just... Um, Two other things. Uh, one is when you talk about a small pocket for 30 kilometers, so I want to just make sure that that we're responding to that as well. So 
um, I don't want to be restricted by space either. So if, you know, a 40 kilometer gateway is, you know, four blocks by four blocks, I don't want a 30 kilometer gateway to be one block by one block. So I just want to make sure that, that I get that, uh, that information back as well. Um, again, I want to play back so we're clear. I will give you the can you do it by a, an area, a subset of that area, and if you cannot, what would be our recommendation going forward? Like, do we default back to petition, or do, do you want to have a policy discussion on that? Or, but okay. it starts with are we permitted to do that for a street or multiple streets and then subsets of that? So okay. I'll, I'll give you all those scenarios. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And just one last question. Um, is there, because, you know, it's not a lot of money that we're allocating today, we may get more, uh, but is this something that uh, a councillor could use their temporary traffic calming to, um, to subsidize uh, signage? Uh, through the chair, no, it's uh, not part of the funding envelope at this time. So that would, we'd have to just make a change to the temporary traffic calming policy for what it can be used for. Because it is traffic calming, right? Like sign that says the control. issue is whether it's temporary or not. Once, once you designate the, I think that's well, not the... Well, temporarily, just while you're driving through that street, then you want. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So I think it's okay. back to my earlier comment on the other matter of, you know, when you bring the budget guideline report, and again, I will share all this with the treasurer, that because others have asked what can we put in that envelope and so forth, so we will share that with the treasurer and, and bring that back to you okay. as to whether or not there's deviations for that, or you can give staff direction to to give us uh, to bring back deviation when we bring that report. Okay, because uh, I mean the traffic calming budget has to come back anyway in the next term of council, and I think that there, you know, there's already been some discussion about, you know, should we be able to use it for other measures that are not so temporary, like speed humps, if we know that they they work in a certain area, should we be able to finance that through that that separate uh, office budget? So this would be something else I would look at. I look forward to the uh, response back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Drews. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's been a long time uh, coming for us. I remember we went to AMO with my colleague, uh, Councillor Kakesh, uh, as a delegation from the city to work with the province on bringing the gateway speed. And I'm very, very happy to see that it's coming. We've been working on it since 2016. But uh, my question will be probably... Uh, I looked at the numbers and uh, the cost the, the cost that's going to cost the city to translate how, what this is going to impact for rural residents, like villages, for instance, for Metcalf. Because like, right now we have streets of 40 and 50s, and I know that the gateway, uh, that's going to help be consistent for rural residents. Will we be able to implement the villages in one speed, and is it the cost? Cost similar to the, what we're going to implement in the city, like in downtown, for instance, or uh, in suburbia? Uh, through the chair, uh, it would depend on the size of the uh, the pocket because the funding envelope is only 50000 per year and we're trying to hit as many uh, locations as we can over the two-year period, $100,000. So it depends on the pocket and we'll work with each councillor to discuss uh, the size of the pocket that they'll be able to implement with uh, gateway signage. Uh, but the gateway signs in rural villages, do we have the same policy that we have across the board in the city? No. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Fleury. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, La Présidente. Uh, so my question is really related to funding. So I know you've done some analysis. I think the example you've given the report is Sandy Hill. You've done uh, pocket analysis. We've worked with staff and the community for some time now on that. We were waiting for the Highway, Tra Highway Traffic Act changes and the guidelines that were quite delayed, I guess over a year uh, we were waiting on those, but now there'll be a, an expectation. I think it's important for us to understand. So what's the best way to proceed? Uh, is it the 2019 budget? Is it staff that will highlight which zones of the city are prioritized in terms of uh, the, those, uh, those gateway panels? How do we go about identifying uh, next steps and priorities? Because now we're piloting, but we, we need to get to an implementation phase, and I know that there will be pressure for, from all communities to see these implemented sooner. OK, 
Counselor, I think the starting point is uh, assessing how, how many counselors want these pockets identified. We need to collect that data, so I'm just confirming Mr. Brinkman's staff will, uh, will visit each counselor to see if there's uh, a request in their neighborhood, and then we'll assess how far we can go with the 50,000. Um, and then if there's a gap, obviously that's part of the next term of council budget discussion. Okay. And from a community standpoint, you're, you're asking the communities to work directly with their counselors on this? Like, what's the best? I, I could just see a lot of interest. I mean, our media is here. They're going to cover it. And then we're going to, we're going to create a void, right? Where how do you go from an approval at committee and council to uh, identifying priorities, uh, recognizing that funding will be the, the, the nuts and bolts of the issue, but procedurally you're asking communities to work with their counselors and the, to the counselors to raise to Mr. Brickman and his team for their review? Or is, is that the best approach? Yeah, I think first cut, you know your wards better than anybody else. I think we come and talk to you. Is, is, there, is there a demand for this? Is there a, what's your first blush at it? Uh, we'll look at the list. We'll map that against the 50,000 that we have, and then we'll, we'll come back to uh, to all council via memo or something to say, look, here's the request and here's the gap or not, and put it through the budget process if we need more. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, um, Councillor Wilkinson. Yeah, just a couple of questions. One is, if you get $50,000 for each ward, if you're able to do more than one area within the 50000 I have a lot of areas where there's only a few roads that go in, so you don't get as many signs. Not like the example you gave had a lot. I have one area I can do with three signs. We, we only have, have 50000 citywide. That's what we have. Citywide. Citywide. Okay, how much is it per sign, double sign? Uh, through the chair, uh, one sign is around $300 to implement. So the two signs you need would be about $600. That's correct. And I, and I agree with Councillor McKenna that if we could use some of our traffic calming, I, I think I've got enough signs on the road paid at what the speed limit is and things now to last me forever. Um, there's so many few things we can do with that money. It's truly it's really very difficult that way. And these are things I think are really highly desirable. One of the things I have a problem with is Canada was always 40. So in many areas, Canada was already 40. And then some of the new ones that started adding to communities are partly 40 and partly 50 because it, I think roads that changed that, we had to we were able to get one of those changed back. So there, it is a little bit complicated in places. But the, uh, there aren't a lot of Canada because of its terrain the 10 many not a lot of connect, cross-connecting streets, so there's not as many signs required. Um, the other one is new development. I've got two new subdivisions underway now. They put a clause in there about getting traffic calming signs, whether this would be or not. This is two subdivisions together. There are only going to be two roads, I think maybe three, but I think only two connecting out of it. So if, to get that in, it, can we make the developer put these in as they're building these new communities so that the city doesn't have that cost initially? Uh, through, through the development process, um, they, they actually fund new signage in their communities once they're built and we get final acceptance. So they flip the bill for that. So we will, we will charge the developer back for any new signage. So any new subdivision that's built will automatically get gateway signage. So the ones that I have under just getting started now, I could let you know where those are and you can put them on the list. Or who's going to make them do that? Because sometimes I find these get missed. Uh, the city. The city will do that. We'll do that Please through. Who in the city? Uh, our office. Your office. Yes. So if I let you know where those are, you can say those streets are going to have to have these signs on initially. Correct. Because we might as well try to get as many of those as we can for the new areas. And we'll, we'll continue to do that through the, uh, the, the development process. We'll sign these subdivisions as they get final acceptance. And if there's a subdivision tacked on to another one, um, and they, uh, the other entries of that area are not signed, how are you going to handle that? Uh, if it's a new subdivision that was registered with the city after 2010, those signs should be coming and we'll still be charging back the developer for those. So if there's two subdivisions side by side, we'll work in conjunction with both uh, developers to get signage installed. But if there's an old area and a new area, how do we work at that? Uh, the older areas would have to follow the process in terms of prioritizing with the existing funding. Because what the new area could have it just for that new area, even though it's tied together. That's correct. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Deans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are there areas where the uh, signs are being posted at 40? Are those roads being designed um, to accommodate lower speeds than the traditional uh, streets were? Uh, if they if they are local roads, they are they are designed with uh, with a low, uh, smaller cross section and more frequent driveways, um, as well as parking both on both sides, which helps to reduce the speed of uh, traffic. Uh, if parking isn't utilized, the speeds do tend to go up, but uh, they are under uh, that consideration when they're being developed. So they are designed differently than, for example, in my ward where the roads were designed 30 or 40 years ago. They they are a lot. Uh, wider. I'm just wondering um, if posting 40 instead of 50 uh, in those neighborhoods is going to have any impact on actual travel speeds. Um, through the chair, uh, we are we're trying to approach this with a consistent uh, message that all local roads and collector roads operating at 40 will have that 40 km an hour speed limit which gives uh, police more of an effective tool to enforce speed limits in local roads and collector roadways uh, as well as uh, drivers ex expectations when they enter new communities. So currently the default speed is 50 is that right? That's correct. And is that still appropriate? I mean, what I seem to be hearing is the desire to make the default speed 40. Uh, the default speed is only suggested on uh, like major collectors when they're unposted and, and arterial roads when they're not posted. Uh, that's why this policy is being brought forward to, to change the local roads down to local and collector roadways down to 40 kilometers an hour. Everywhere. Across the so city. you can't just make a default policy that says all local streets are going to be 40? Well, that would change the, the speed limit on all of our unposted uh, arterial roadways and collector, major collector roadways as well. Uh, this is the guidelines that were suggested through the province. Uh, and we worked on a steering committee with the province to develop this policy, and this was uh, what all municipalities, or most municipalities, wanted to go with, was creating gateway signage where they can create 40 kilometers. Okay. Um, I'm just interested in how you're going to define neighborhoods. Because I think of some of the neighborhoods in my ward and they're vastly different. Um, and some of them might be much larger than others. Um, so you said that you had done some preliminary work. Could I see how you have defined the neighborhoods in my ward perhaps between now and council? Uh, absolutely. We do have maps for every ward that we've created which show the pockets. Uh, there are over 1,500 pockets that we could sign with gateway signage. Uh, some neighborhoods are, are very large and some are smaller, one street for example. Um, but uh, yeah, we do have that information that we can provide to you and counselors. Okay. Yeah, because I think it's important to have a, a sense of how that would be delineated throughout the ward. And um, the other thing I was a little bit concerned about, it seemed to, you seem to have some um, weight on um, what the ward councillor said. And the process that we use right now um, puts the onus on the community to make a decision about that. And it seems like you've moved away from community consultation around uh, um, signage and speed limits um, to put the onus on the councillor. Now, of course, the councillor can do a consultation if they choose, but maybe they won't. And it may, to me, it just sounds like we're taking, um, taking. Councillor, could you talk a little bit closer to the mic? Sorry. Sorry. I'm just being quiet today, I guess. Um, I, I just, I, I don't want to take the onus away from the community and just give it to the councillor. I think there has to be a process that allows the community to weigh in. And, you know, to a certain extent, um, I think there is perhaps a little bit of a difference when it comes to the suburbs versus maybe the core of the city. And, um, you know, 
Is 30 a reasonable default in the downtown core? Is there anybody that might be road users that might also want to weigh in on the appropriateness of that? Like, I just don't think it's just a word council decision. I think there has to be some sort of a public process. So how would that be taken into account? Mr. Chair, the council, you're absolutely right. And if we're leaving that impression, we're not trying to push that onto the ward council. What we will do is we're going to share with you the pocket maps that staff have done. I think it's important that we do that check-in with you to get your first reaction as to, you know, have we defined these communities in the right format and so forth. At the end of the day, staff need to give you the professional advice in terms of those limits and so forth. And then if there is some consultation that you want to do with your community in whatever format you want, we'd be happy to support you, be there with you and do that. I think when you look at it globally, a lot of it will be very obvious and straightforward, but there are distinctions to each ward and each neighborhood and subsets of those neighborhoods that we need to reflect, and it's not one size fits all. And I think if you're going to want to consult a little bit and take your time on this, absolutely. We'll support you. Staff are great in that regard, and we'll work with each council in the unique, distinct communities. The road, you know, I came from this policy prior to amalgamation where we posted 40K for exactly the reason that staff are talking about and speaks to your point about enforceability and so forth. And there are very unique situations where grid neighborhoods were easy to sign versus, you know, Qualicum Woods where it's a maze and you get in and you can't get out, no clear entry and exit to that community and so forth. So I understand exactly what you're talking about. I've lived those signage issues, and I think staff have done a great job of the first cut. We consult with you. We can then start to look at sequencing priorities and timing, and then I think we separate the 30K as a subset of that discussion. Let's stay with the 40K, and then we follow up with the other pieces also. Okay. And just one last question, and that is how did you define an neighborhood? Are they sort of all similar size? Are some of them massive and some of them small? We didn't really define it by neighborhood. We defined it by pockets. So a pocket is created based on the boundary roads, collectors being the cutting point of that, and we're signing all of the locals that are bound by collector pockets. So if you have a collector on the north, east, west, and south of that, all of the local roads within that area would be defined as a pocket, and that's not necessarily a full neighborhood. It would just be a pocket within that neighborhood. So it all depends. They're all unique. We'll provide you with what your map would look like for your ward, and we can discuss possibilities of signing each community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Chernyshenko. Thank you. As happens when you are lower down on the list, a lot of the important questions have been asked here. I think to reiterate some of what we're hearing is we are all likely to hear, first of all, I'm glad that each ward is getting an allocation because then we don't have the fight between wards, but what we will have is, in a sense, the battle within wards where we have many communities, all of which believe they need calming and all of which probably do. And so our great challenge is going to be to identify which ones go first and in what priority and ultimately make some people happy and even more people not happy in the first round. There's been some discussion already about what criteria are being used. I'm wondering if we're to take an example of the GLEAD where there has been a longstanding program of rolling out that in a sense is almost a decade ahead of some parts of the city where there has been a movement towards 40-kilometer zones. That was something that was approved by council, I believe, well over a decade ago, but because of the cost of putting in the signage, it's been rolled out a few streets at a time. Is that something where you might have a neighborhood like that that is partway through this where you would, in a sense, treat that as a priority as opposed to others? I'm not looking for staff to give me the defense for how I say no to those communities that don't go first, but rather some sense of why one may have been picked first and certainly chronologically that a community has already been going down this road and is, in a sense, being assessed already. Is that something that's going to factor in? And I guess part of that is going to be 
What, what do we do with the 40 kilometer hour signs that are already in on a number of streets? Is that something ultimately we'd say we would say, well, they're there. It actually costs less to leave them there than to send the workers out to go get them. Uh, has anyone thought through that? Do, do we remove some or do we just treat those that are there as being, well, that's double, uh, doubling up and it's a waste of money to, to go get them and bring them in? Is there any thought on those? So, Councillor, to your first part, I, I just want to reiterate what I've been saying is I think that's the discussion that we want to have with you in terms of your ward, and we'll bring all that information as to where the existing 40K zones and the signs are and so forth. On the take them out versus leave them in, we'll look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. In some cases, we could reuse the signs if it's cheaper to relocate them. We'll leave them in. We'll do whatever is uh, common sense will prevail. Okay. And to the question, then, I guess, of, of, of chronology, uh, you know, communities that have already, in a sense, been pre-approved, is that something you, you've already begun thinking of? Uh, roads that have already completed a petition process to get 40 kilometers an hour. Uh, we, we have been, been implementing them. We're trying to, uh, to slow that process down right now because we know that gateway signage is potentially coming. Um, at this point, we, we have put in signs uh, based on petition process as of last month we, we are still taking inquiries for that uh, to, to go back to the last point as well the the signs that are left in uh, that are within communities uh, that would no longer be required uh, we are leaning towards removing those signs entirely because it could speak to somebody traveling on that road uh, and turning off onto a road that doesn't have a 40 kilometer an hour sign and, and go back to the default uh, 50 kilometers and, and we're trying to be consistent by, by only uh, signing the roads on the perimeter of, of each zone so we are in discussion with with, uh, with our staff to, to come up with a process for that and reusing the signs is, is ultimately what we're, what we're looking at. Okay. All right, well, thank you. I know we will all have plenty of questions as in the actual implementation. I suspect this is going to be, uh, as they say, oversubscribed, uh, and, and our challenge will be to walk through uh, uh, a sensible, logical process for our communities so that those that don't come first uh, are reassured that they are coming, and coming in a timely fashion, um, even if they aren't the very first to, uh, to be signed in this way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, and the other way to do it, Councilor Shoshenko, is to have a robust discussion at budget about whether we should be putting more money into this, into this program, which would assist with dealing with the backlog. Um, uh, Councilor Cadre. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And just coming back to this item of the 40 kilometers an hour speed limit, I want to go back to what Councilor Deans was raising in terms of the public consultation uh, component. And I think I heard at the start of the report uh, is the fact that uh, in newer communities or newer neighborhoods, it would be an automatic 40 kilometers an hour. So what would happen to that public consultation with those neighbors that may or may not have already moved into the new community if you give that, if you give that direction to the developer to go ahead and put 40 kilometers in those neighborhoods, yet some of those uh, people have not moved into the neighborhood, how, how would you consult them? <coughs> Um, new, new communities, like new developments, are, are automatically getting 40 kilometers an hour uh, already as part of a speed zoning policy passed in 2009. Uh, so this would be an amendment to that policy, and, and they would already get signs regardless uh, of being consulted or not. It would automatically go to 40 kilometers an hour without public consultation. So the new neighborhood would not have any option of public consultation on the 40 kilometers? Uh, no, they would, they would automatically have uh, 40 kilometers an hour as per our policy and how we've been practicing since uh, 2010 and the policy that was passed in 2009 for new developments. Did you or the city do any kind of studies or uh, surveys on the fact that there are a number of streets that already have 40 kilometers an hour speed limits marked, uh, whether they be collectors or neighborhood streets? as to the uh, compliance rate on those streets. Uh, currently, is it, you know, 50% of the uh, uh, drivers that are obeying that 40 kilometers, 60%? Uh, through the chair, uh, it does vary from street to street. Uh, the characteristics of the road dictate uh, how fast people will drive. Uh, we do have extensive data on, on a lot of our streets, and uh, we continue to collect data on, on through the uh, temporary traffic common project as well. Uh, we, we collect a lot of data on all of our locals, and it varies um, 
Uh, I can't speak specifically on, on what each street would be or, or an average of it, but we do see fairly low compliance with, uh, with roads that are posted that, uh, that don't meet the characteristics of, of the roadway and are posted artificially lower. Um, in terms of this policy, with going with a consistent 40 kilometer an hour uh, across each neighborhood, we're hoping that the compliance will increase. Uh, we haven't obviously done data collection, but that is part of our game plan moving forward is to collect data pre and post implementation. Okay, thank you for that, because uh, my concern is that you put any sign on the road that you like, 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers, it's the, uh, you know, the obligation of the driver to follow that speed limit. And I understand what Mr. Manconi mentioned earlier, that the police had a better tool to you know, enforce. But still, if the current signage that's out there on streets that is posted at 40 and people are not complying with that, are we creating a bigger issue? And that would be my concern. Uh, through the chair, um, I guess it could be that there is an inconsistency in, in the way we post speed limit signs right now, that some local roads uh, who have gone through the petition process will have 40 kilometers an hour and then they turn off that road and there's, a, there's no signs at all or it's posted at 50. So uh, through this method of having a consistent approach for communities and pockets where they would be posted 40 and 40 throughout the community until they see otherwise, we're hoping that that uh, compliance with the 40 kilometer an hour speed limit increases. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. And, and I think part of the the answer to your question was said earlier as well that it um, there's another tool in the toolbox for the police. Right? If it's posted to 40 and you're going 50, then um, you know the corollary to that is we need to get the police out there more often. But that's that's a, that's a different discussion at a different committee. But I think to, to staff's point, it does does put another tool in the toolbox in terms of enforcement. Um, uh, Councillor Manette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify, uh, so I understand before we close this issue, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Manconi, you mentioned uh, you'll be asking the opinion of the uh, elected official once you have the uh, area uh, identified in that warrant. Now, that will not be final. You mentioned that it will be public consultation. We will meet with you. We'll show you the map of how we've defined these blocks and there's there's methodology of those blocks right because it has to be enforceable and so forth and we'll ask for your advice and uh, what I was suggesting uh, based on Councillor Dean's inquiry was if you want to consult with your community you can go ahead and do that and we will support you in that endeavor in terms of consulting with that you know, I think you need to think through that because we've all done this enough that if you go out and ask a bunch of people what they think about a, a speed limit um, you'll get a lot of different reactions and, and opinions uh, staff will bring forward the, the identification of the blocks. You uh, uh, input based on a lot of the comments you've heard around the table today, priorities, what about this street, what about that street. So it's a bit of an iterative process. So if you were to come back and say 30 kilometers, as was mentioned earlier, am I to understand that the decision of the ward councillor would rule over uh, decision or uh, comments of the residents. Because when you look downtown, it's not only residents that live downtown. You have people from the suburbs that uh, drive to the downtown core. Um, I would have difficulty if this uh, motion is uh, geared towards the council only without having an aspect that the public has to say and do it also. No, I believe you're correct, Councillor. The 30K question is a separate issue, which what I've committed to is I'm going to talk to legal to get their interpretation of what was approved by the province as to whether or not the question from uh, Councillor McKenney was, you've come back with what we asked to come back with, which is a 40K designated by blocks. The question she asked is, can I take that and make the default speed 30K? either within that entire block or a subset of that block. I need legal to walk me through that process to say, are we permitted? And then what I 
committed to say is that if, and if the answer is no, which I suspect it will be no, is we will probably get and we're right back to the default of go out and petition and get feedback and staff always provide their professional advice on that. So to your point about, you know, if the, if the request is can you make an arterial street 30 kilometers an hour downtown Ottawa and they tell you right now the answer is going to be no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I was getting at. I mean, okay, thank you. Uh, removing signs, I mean, I, I don't understand why we have to remove the signs. The signs say 40 kilometers, and I do, I do understand what you're saying, that we could, people could think, well, there's a sign there, but there's no sign there. But if, if we add the gateway signs, that's the purpose of the gateway signs, to say that this area is 40 kilometers. Now, if we start removing signs, there's a cost to removing signs. And I guess I could ask you how many signs we have presently that says 40 kilometers uh, you know, in Ottawa um, and factor in how much will it cost to have them removed. And I think, you know, I, I think it's a useless uh, exercise to remove them. Uh, you know, myself personally, uh, I think leave the signs there. It says 40 kilometers. It doesn't contradict the gateway signs. And uh, that would be my opinion on it, although I will not be here in 2019, so we'll let the next Councillor uh, make the final decision on it. Mr. Chair, Councillor, my advice to you on that is let staff, leave that with staff to figure out, and I'll tell you why, two things. The last thing you want to do is give someone who's breaking the speed limit a legal out to say there's in, in, um, inconsistency in the application of these zones, which is what staff just reiterated, and secondly on the costs. You're literally pulling that sign out with, with just one of our uh, crane hoists and we're going to reuse them so if you're into recycling, if you're into lowering costs and so forth, it may not cost uh, significantly more. So we're looking at it holistically. It's not just the monetary thing, it's also the enforceability thing. We don't want to have loopholes. And again, I've managed an area where 40Ks were, uh, it was the opposite. You had to sign every street and I saw people beat speeding tickets because we had missing signs. So there's truth to others. Uh, there's, there's a professional opinion in that regard. Yeah, I, I think, and I don't want to drag this on because it's uh, long enough as it is, but I think consultation with the police department to find out uh, if there is actually uh, an out for a driver if they left the signs in, I think that would be uh, interesting to see what the police department would have to say. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, just a quick follow-up question. Um, so can the community say no? And what happens if they do say no? I, I can't imagine the circumstance where that happened, but I'm just following up on what Councillor Manette. So if you have a public consultation, everybody in the room says, hell no, um, we don't want that particular speed. What happens then? Uh, I guess uh, they would just fall lower on the priority for, for receiving implementation of gateway speed limit signs. So we just push them to the bottom of the list. If, we wouldn't if say we're not, not doing a, it, we'd just say we're doing it 10 years. If it's not a desire for them to, to, to have it and it's not a priority for that, for that ward, um, then I guess they could be, they could be bypassed and, and put down at the, the, uh, the end of the, the ranking for the priority of implementing these. I guess what I'm getting at is, is what we're passing here is, is a default law. So whether you want it or you don't want it, it's going to be 40. Is, is that eventually? Sorry. Eventually. Eventually. Okay. Um, uh, Councillor Kakish, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. My question is with regards to the um, obviously the new provincial governments moving, you know, fast and furious on repealing a lot of things and moving in certain directions. And I know a lot of the work that's happened here, I mean, it's been going on for many years, but uh, more recently when we got the approval, I think, uh, from Minister Del Duca at the time. So uh, do we have any indication before we start doing all this work that there's any policy changes in, in the direction of where they're moving with regards to the HTA, whether on this or, or other files? Um, I haven't seen any, but I'm just wondering, based on your discussions on a bureaucratic level as well as um, what you're hearing, if there's any um, intentions to change any of this. Uh, through the chair, um, so you're asking about changes to the HDA to allow for this? Sure, that, that may, you know, 
that may have a conflict with what we're doing or trying to do uh, down the road or you know I know it's not a priority probably for them on the uh, scale of things but um, if there is anything that could create a conflict for us uh, of implementing this down the road uh, not to my knowledge um, this this the changes to the highway traffic act uh, came into effect uh, May of this year to allow for us to do this um, and as previously previously stated uh, we are working with uh, the province on a working group for full enforcement which may have some other uh, impacts but at this point we have we're not uh, privy to that information until further legal discussion has taken place to to kind of iron out any details of what's required as part of that program and how it may be impacting this program. Okay, so just something to take back, I guess, because it's right around that month before that this, the, the change actually happens, so just something to take into consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's the last speaker we have on this. So on the report, carried. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next item was to be uh, Councillor Leeper's item, but we were voted to remove that at his request. So we're um, at the last item on the agenda, which is uh, Councillor Caudry's uh, dedicated eastbound left turn traffic signal at the intersection of Hazel Dean Road and Carp Road. I know he's prepared to speak to it. Um, do we require him to speak to it? Or are we able to vote on it now? Okay. Okay. Um, any notices of motion for uh, consideration of subsequent meeting? Inquiries? Adjour adjournment? Adjourned. Adjourned. Okay, we'll see you all on uh, September the 5th. What? Because we had to move this one because of quorum. We had to move because of quorum. Hmm?